And I'm going to close this. We're going to go on now with um, part two of our knowledge management solution. I'm talking about here, right? So everyone's ready to get buried in the angle brackets, right? My name is Paul Schaefline. Um, I'm here from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm, a not, I'm a U.S., but I'm not from Texas. I think I'm the only American here who's not from Texas. Oh, no, AC. Right? Oh, right, all right. But he's Southern, so, so he gets to That's talk. right, that's right. I don't talk funny. <laughs> really? It's nice in my world. Please don't shatter it. So in my, in my career, I've done a lot of back-end systems work, worked for an accounting firm, did a lot of those type of systems, worked at an ISV in the SharePoint world for a while, and we targeted the SharePoint Foundation way back in the day. So this type of the application that we're talking about initially here is right in my sweet spot here. So we, we stepped, up, I stepped up and did a lot of this coding. So I'm going to talk about all the non-sexy bits of SharePoint, right? And all the search and MMSs, all that fun stuff. Nothing of that for me this afternoon. But this is all the pieces that we're going to do. I'm going to cover it all. And I am not building it live. It's there. It's running. Uh, uh, but I'm not even going to pretend to try to code it live. But I'll show you all the pieces one by one. We'll go through all the spies and talk about them. And there are many cases where I ran into issues in the uh, sandbox that kind of frustrated me, the same stuff that Eric was talking about, right? And as I run across those, I'll flip. So I have a second solution on my machine, which I called the advanced solution, that ha is a farm trust one that let me, just so I can put it there to show you pieces of code that I find helpful when I write this is typical on-prem applications. Uh, those will all be put up onto CodePlex, both the, the core sandbox one as well as the advanced one. They'll be up on the CodePlex solution so you can get these snippets of code because depending on what you're doing, you may want to find those things kind of helpful. So the last name is hard to spell. It's all up there. Find me afterwards if you need to email me or so on later. So first thing I'm going to talk about. Okay, I'm going to do a little back and forth. I have the slide deck published up here primarily to keep me on track and as well if you don't want to, if you look at the code, you're trying to figure out what Paul was mentioning, you, you can see the things here. First thing we talk about is the site columns, right? And uh, this is the one thing in SharePoint that requires braces when you type a GUID, so you need to remember to put those. But the last bullet point is my, you know, the preview I was mentioning before. When you declare an uh, um, event receiver for a list, you need to specify the template ID and those template IDs are specified in a list definition. We didn't want to build a list definition when we're building this application. As we're talking about this, we have a knowledge base application, and that's really what I, I call a departmental type application. The help desk may want a knowledge base, the, the operations group may want a knowledge base, the developers may want a knowledge base. So I could be putting this in three different site collections, for example. I really didn't want to have to tie myself down to creating a whole big list definition. Plus, a list definition typically requires the view defined in XML, and it's hard enough to write CAMEL, let alone have to write views that mix up escape JavaScript inside XML, inside HTML, and it's just really kind of ugly. So the idea that I'll show you here by I can create an event receiver and attach it to a content type instead of a list. It, I, I've run into a lot of people who don't know this capability exists, and it's a natural way for me to then say I have this content type that defines the columns, and in addition, I can specify some behavior, the, the event receiver, in addition to custom forms if that's the route I want to go. Also, the out-of-the-box list forms is my brilliant idea. Uh, I don't like to write any more code than I don't have to. And when I go into companies to talk about let's, why are we using SharePoint, I'm a developer. You want to pay me to write security code? You want to pay me to write CRUD forms? I mean, seriously, of all the resources we have, why do I want to spend time doing all kinds of menial, well, I call them menial, but repetitive tests, create an entry, delete an entry, That's in security especially, right? So I only want to get the edge cases. And if we took a step back at our application here, what we want to do is display the knowledge base article in a specific format. There was no requirement about the format for entering it. So we wrote a custom display and we just used the out-of-the-box form. So that's what we're going to do here. So let me, go to, um, let me go to my code and show you what I'm doing here. This is my solution. We, we should be able to see things in the back. So um, here is our Visual Studio project. And let me zoom in on this. And you can see this is the project structure that the Waldeck and Richter put, talked about earlier this morning, right? So we're, we want to use a similar thing over and over again. And so we don't have any mystery. When you get this code downloaded, 
if you want to find where things are, you should be able to find immediately in the project without having to, to click all over the place. So uh, fields is our module. So when I added the spy here called a uh, empty element, there isn't a built-in spy for fields. Now you have a couple ways of doing these. You can go to the browser and create a content type and create the site columns in the browser and then save as a template and import it into Visual Studio. I don't like doing that because inevitably I pick too many or too few of the 400 items that show up in the list of things to import. In addition, clicking in the browser to me isn't any better than copy-paste in, in Visual Studio. So here's a, a, a bunch of angle brackets. The key things here to remember, again, we have curly braces around our field names. They're all lowercase. And to get these, if we have new people in the room under tools, I have my create GUID, right? So this is everybody's favorite schema generator tool, right? I'm clicking these, and, and there we go. So you need to create a ton of these GUIDs. This, you had this app open for a long time as you're doing this. And so what I'm showing you here is just a, a list of our fields. And you can see there's not, very, not a lot of uh, complexity here. We have a choice column, which is the first one. This is one of the trade-offs we made. So I'm going to categorize an uh, article. And the natural way to do that, of course, is MMS, right? SharePoint Online has the metadata service. I can create a term set in online. How do I normally let someone pick a term from the term set? There's a built-in control called the taxonomy web picker control, which does not run in the sandbox. So you get this close, having it done, and then we're done. So in our base solution, the sandbox solution, we chose a drop-down. Right? So this is just a choice column where we're putting in a bunch of different things. Now, these were just arbitrary things I made up to say this is you know, pieces of SharePoint, if I'm writing a knowledge base article. And in addition, I chose these because it, uh, I, when I did some test data, I decided to download some of the public feed from Stack Exchange or uh, SharePoint Overflow is what it used to be called. And so it kind of fit in naturally with that type of thing. So this is just arbitrary made up values that I did to support what I'm doing here, right? Um, obviously, we could switch out these choices easily enough by just changing the XML. <coughs> so we have our choice field. Uh, I have a note, which is a, the, the type of note is a multi-line text. So you can see we let people enter a summary. Notice I have a, dis a group. I want to make sure I have a consistent group so that as these columns are displayed in the UI, they're easy to find. I have a note here, which is uh, another note. This is the content. So I have a summary and a content. The summary does not allow HTML, and the, the content does allow HTML. So that's the only difference between those two, which text mode is true. And those are the only differences there. Um, we talked about it being able to uh, approve a content. Well, we went back and forth on this quite a bit, right? Out of the box, the SharePoint list, I can enable moderation is the API call. On the UI, it's called a, a, a require approval. And so we are choosing this moderation slash approval to decide whether we're going to show these in our web part, in our summary web part. In addition, we wanted to have the ability to decide when it should be generated, or when to be available to be generated for PDF. So the idea around this status is that if it's final, I can generate the PDF version of it. If it's not final, I can't. So it's a, it's a little redundant, but it, we needed this just to show some of the aspects that we're going to be doing later on. In addition to the, M, the category, which is currently choice, maybe MMS in the future, we also wanted just a, a free text keyword. And this is what we're going to end up using for the search. So whatever's typed in on an article in the keyword, that can be used to drive the, the database search later in the week. So you'll see how these things all tie together. And those are the columns, right? A knowledge-based application is not very complex. I forgot to show the word that We didn't show the requirement document. Well, up on the, on the CodePlex site, we also have our functional requirement document that lists all these out, so I knew what to build. I got so excited about the code, I forgot to mention that, right? So before we even got started, we had these discussions. We just laid things out in a requirements document. And it was just a, word, a table in Word that lists all the different columns we wanted and the certain types. So you can see there's a source for all that. Now, in addition to this, right, I'm all gung-ho. I'm ready to go with my KB article, right? And we've talked about how I'm going to have a custom web part that's going to display this information. So I'm going to be writing some C-sharp code. Does C-sharp code always work perfectly every time? Well, we write it, and it was perfect. But then you deploy it in a real-world environment, and stuff happens, and we get exceptions. So how do I troubleshoot that later on? So I need to do logging. This is just basic good code hygiene. You should instrument your code if necessary. You should always log it. 
We didn't go into instrumentation here because I'd be talking until, well, through beer time. We don't want that. But we do want to talk about logging. As Eric mentioned, the Patterns and Practices group talks about logging, and it has some beautiful assembly of code. You just set a reference, and you can write to the ULS logs. That doesn't work in the sandbox. So what am I going to do for logging? So what I have done is I've defined some columns, and I'm going to create a list that's just called logs, and I'm going to hide it from the quick launch. And in my code, then, if I, need, if I catch an exception, I can write an entry to that list. And then if something, someone calls me, something went wrong, in theory, the support department could look at that list and see it. Now, it's not, it's not ideal for logging. It's, it's certainly not an audit trail, because I need to have every user has to have write ability to that list. Otherwise, the logging wouldn't work. But I need something. What am I going to do if, if my code fails? If I'm only writing UI code, well, I could output text to the browser in a, in a comment or white text on a white background, something like that. But what if I'm going to be doing some back-end code like an event receiver? I need to be able to log this. So just because you can't use ULS doesn't mean you're absolved of all responsibility for troubleshooting your, your app in the future. So in regards to that, I just created a handful of text columns that I'm going to use for the logging. And you can see the typical things. Um, in addition to just the message and so on, the, uh, I put in there for the class and the method name. So that's, as a developer, if I want to troubleshoot something, sometimes the stack trace is helpful. Sometimes the stack trace can disclose information I don't want it all to. So I have the choice there. And then there's some other fields at the bottom that I didn't use. So those are my columns. Any question? I typically, I would expect none, right? But first thing, when I'm building a custom application, I have data. Where am I going to store my data? So I'm going to do this exercise of defining the schema. And defining the schema in SharePoint is a lot of XML. OK? Oh, one thing I should point out, right? I'll ask a question, and the first answer I hear is what I assume everybody wants. So if I ask if are we good to move on, and you're not good to move on, you've got to say something loud and fast, otherwise I'm going to move on. OK? Well, we OK with that? See? Waldeck learns. All right. Columns aren't much value to me all by themselves, so I need to put them into, right, or if I have, in a database, I have columns in a table. SharePoint, I need to put those into a content type. So let me go back to my content type branch here, and I'll zoom in on that. I'll try to at least. So as I talked about, I have two content types that I want to create, one to store the article, and another for my logging. So I have the two of them there, right? And these, this naming convention that we didn't talk about early in the process, well, Paul talked about it in his head a lot. So here's the, you know, I didn't, I just named them what made sense. KB, you see a lot of KBs everywhere. That's a fun, That's a fun hey, I have fun. Don't mess with me. There is a SharePoint spy for content types. So when I chose add a new item, I chose content types, except for this one. This one is the one with the event receiver. So remember we talked about in our article when, as our requirement document says, when um, initially our requirement was that if it was approved and the status is final, then we wanted to fire off that code to generate the PDF document. Whether that's actually how it works, I'll let Ben go through when he talks about that tomorrow. But that was the idea around this. So I needed this, this content type with an event receiver. So, I have my content type here, and you can see I'm just inheriting from item. And again, I have the item ID. If you aren't familiar, I have 0x01 zero, zero, zero is item, 00 zero, is a separator, and then I have a good with no dashes and no curly braces because it's not a field. And I've specified that. That's my article content type ID. Again, I'm using a consistent group name so things can get found where I expect them to be. And now in this particular one, I'm inheriting equals false, which is atypical. I don't want to use the event receivers that are defined on the item, which is none. I want to specify my event receiver for this content type, so I cannot use the inherit equals true. And since I'm not inheriting, then I have to specify the information on the field. So you can then see I'm defining all the fields for my content type. Fields need, fields have crooked teeth, right? I have braces around field IDs. And you can see them all spelled out there, and I have to include the name. Because I'm not inheriting, if I don't specify the name, it doesn't work. So that's why you see that all spelled out again. Now, I've renamed a couple. The, the, first one, first, the first two are the out of the box, ID and title, that come with item. But I want it to be KB article ID and KB article title. So I renamed them. But I used the out of the box good for that field. 
And finding those is always fun. How, how do we go find them? How do you guys find out-of-the-box IDs for fields? Server Explorer is what Waldeck says. Anybody else? Yeah, so, okay, um, I've had people who say they go to the 14 you know, SharePoint root folder and dig around in the out-of-the-box features. That shows you that there, too. Did you know that there is an a API for this? Let me switch over to the slide deck and show you this real quick. There is a, an object in the API called SP built-in field ID. There's also one called SP built-in content type ID that is basically a bunch of constants that has that ID. So in PowerShell, this first one is just doing a get all of them, and it just spits out the whole list of what they are. The second one here, I'm saying I actually want the, the, the field called title, and it spits out the do it for me right there in PowerShell. Right? Which is a lot easier for me, because I usually have PowerShell open all the time. So that's how I get those IDs. It's, and, and as you're writing code, you can do the same. Obviously, this class is available as well. So that's a little tip on that. That's how I got those IDs. Um, the bottom two I'm not supposed to talk about because Wicker's going to cover them later, right? MMS is, you're covering the, tax, the taxonomy fields later, right? So you'll see the taxonomy stuff talked about later. So this is my table or my list defining all my columns. One for log, one for article. I'm going to scroll down now. This is the article we're talking about here. I'm not inheriting, so I need to tell it what my form is. The XML document element has a, two types of children. One is form templates, one is receivers. I'm not inheriting, so I need to specify form templates. And these values that you see right here, lines 24, 25, 26, are the out-of-the-box forms. So that web part that automatically figures out what columns exist and gives you an entry for them, done. I'm done writing code forms to enter data. And then lastly, the XML for the receivers. If you've written event receivers before, this looks very familiar to you. I'm specifying which event I want to cover and a class and an assembly in which to, to handle the event. And then I get to take full advantage of the SharePoint tokens here. Any question on that? OK, so we all understand how the tokens work. All right, a couple of head bobs. You guys are a quiet crowd. you got to wake up. All right, I have content type. I have columns, content types. They're both specified in my project, right? Now we need to talk about features. How do you decide what to call your features and how many of them to have? Well, and like everything in SharePoint, it depends, right? I typically put columns and content types together because they both end up in the gallery at site settings, right? I have a site column gallery and a site content type gallery. I've seen people who lump everything all into one. Keep in mind that having a feature lets me turn on or turn off a piece of functionality independently. So if I might ever want this content type anywhere else ever, and I put it in one big monolithic feature, that means I only get those columns by bringing the whole application over with me. Is that what you want? Maybe it is what you want. I don't know your environment. Typically, I find that's not what you want. So I do things a little bit more uh, uh, in finer detail. If I don't want to overload the list of features because my site administrators complain or they don't understand or they deactivate the wrong one, I can certainly mark a bunch of features as hidden and package them all together in one feature that has nothing but dependencies and activate them all together. In fact, that's what SharePoint has done. There's the collaboration lists feature, which has no spies in it. All it does is it references to all the individual features for announcements and contacts and events and custom and so on and so forth. So that's a perfectly acceptable way to do that. So what I've done is gone through, and in my features, I have one for site columns and content types. And this is just as you'd expect. Uh, I have those chosen, moved over to the right-hand side, give it a title and a description. One thing I really, really like to do is put a feature icon on my features. Because when you look at the list of features, you love that gray icon, right? But if you put yourself a custom icon, that baby pops, right? Anyone know where the feature icons are stored? In it, layouts images. Can I deploy the layouts images from the sandbox? Yes. I cannot. So I don't have any feature icons in this version. In the advanced one, you'll see that they're there. So nothing, nothing too radical about this. I have a site scoped feature because I'm going to the site collection gallery. And I have these 
two content types plus my columns all deployed in there. Are you with me? Oh, yes. Well done. Well done. <laughs> See? Brilliant. Oh, that's right. I'm on the other side. Yes, brilliant. brilliant. Oh, wait, that's the Guinness commercial. Brilliant. All right, next thing I want to do, I have a content type that's made up of columns and all. it's got the properties, behaviors I want. Let's get it in use. So I want to do things in the list instance. And so there is a specific element type called list instance that will then provision a list. And you can specify the list definition ID that you want. I don't have a list definition ID. So I use its sibling element called the content type binding in which I can specify a list URL and a content type ID. And SharePoint will automatically then add that content type to the list for me. Brilliant. What ends up happening is I then get two entries on the new menus. Let me show this to you. I'm going to uh, deploy this. Remember I said a working solution? So let's go ahead and do this. And as it's going through, and it's just deleted all my lists and so on, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. That finishes. Let me go back to my site. And here it is. If I want to click on the home page just to make sure it refreshes. See, I, I had 178 articles. Now I have none. So I'm going to go back to my articles list. And there are none. And if I click new, I have, hey, where's all my columns? What I've done in my list instance element, list instances, so here's the KB articles list instance. And you can see here what the list instance requires a template type on line four or five, right? So I need to specify one of them. What's the best one to choose? So I just chose 100, which is custom list, which provisions an ID and a title. And then I add to it my content type. So the net effect is that in, my, in the browser, now on my new menu, because there's two content types associated with this list, I have two items on the new menu. And this shortcut link that says add new item always chooses the default one, which is the one on top. And as I put in the slide deck, so you can then add, write code that will then go to this list, get the root folder, and there's a property called content type order on the root folder in which you can specify content type IDs that you want in the order in which you want them. The content type order property of the root folder of a list is not available in the, in the sandbox. <coughs> and I cannot find anyone who knows why. It's not, a, it's not scoped to a web application. It's, it, what security thing am I doing here? Why? I, th I think it was an oversight. So I can't programmatically in the sandbox go and fix this. However, the advanced solution that I've got I have code that actually will go through. My code will actually read the feature definition and get the list of list URLs and the content types and write the code to rewrite everything for you automatically. And you can just use that code. It's drop it into any feature on activation, it'll, any list instance type feature, it'll do that for you. Sadly, in my sandbox solution, I have to remember that I can't click the new or I can just go into the list settings and change it. So just because I've provisioned it using the XML, there's nothing to stop me to going into the content type here and change, oops, hit the other one, to change the new order. Does that make sense? This all works as you'd expect. And so I can go through and delete the one that I don't want. So I'm provisioning two lists, article and my log. Notice in the quick launch, I don't show the logs. But if I go to all site content, you can see I have log here. And again, I have a similar item, uh, issue, if you will call it that. I have two entries in here. One is just the item, one is my log. And just to click on this, so you can see I have some other information here. Severity is defined with a default value, and there's just a columns for me to store stuff in here. All right. So, list instances, what's next? What would you do next? Write code. I know you're stomping at the bit to write some code, but how well can I see how my list works if I don't have any data in it, right? So how do I get data into it? Now, if I'm, I'm sorry? It's an end user problem. It's an end user problem. <laughs> yes. yes. 
Okay, we'll move on. So there, if I have a list definition, I can, in the, the element, I can specify a data element and specify rows and columns of data, which is nice. And then when that gets provisioned in SharePoint, it'll automatically add data for me, which I thought, that's great. That doesn't work on the list instance. You have to have a list definition to do that. So they keep putting this back to this list definition stuff, which I really don't want to do. I don't want people clicking new KB article or new application log. Number one, the log has no meaning to anybody outside of my code. And number two, we don't want these knowledge base articles just out there with no, the, we have the special display. We have the ability to tag them with certain names. We have well, all the stuff that kind of depends on it. So I don't want this list definition just hanging out there so people can click new and choose a new knowledge base application. So I, that's why I'm not going list definition. So I'm resorted to writing code. Right? So now we're going to talk, switch back to the slide bit a little bit here, and we'll talk about list data. The slide says accessing data, but in addition, it could be creating it as well. So I have some choices. Um, obviously, I can do things off the server or off the client. And this is our, our server side code is really talking about camel or using the SP query object or link to SharePoint, which really just generates that for me. On the client side, I can use REST, which is now called OData, or the client object model as well. And so back a couple, when 2010 Platform first came out, we, um, at the SharePoint conference, they did this talk where we worked with the product group and we came up with this chart. This is just a vi quick visual reference to give you an idea of what you can do. So if you look in the middle, you can see this is all the possible things that are SharePoint data. Right? External lists we're not going to talk about, right? but we have all this other stuff that we can do here. You can see the width of these bars describes how much of the SharePoint object model will, or how much of the data platform you can access using the various technologies. And in addition, you'll notice on the right-hand side of this slide, you have weakly typed or strongly typed. So these are our choices on how to access data. All right? So as you can tell by the color of my beard, I've been writing code a long time. That JavaScript stuff kind of weirds me out. I didn't write any JavaScript. So I'm doing server-side code. So if I'm doing server-side code, I have these two choices. That's not to say we couldn't have written this as a nice Ajax, EJ query, whatever, but I, we didn't do that. Although there is a reason I'll get to later. So I can use the server OM, or I can use LINK, which stands for Language Integrated Query. If you write server-side object model code to access a list, when you want to reference a column, you have square bracket, quote, and a name. How likely is it that name is the same after a curious administrator goes in and pokes around in the list, right? You have that risk of that. In addition, how likely is it that you'll fat finger something? Remember, these lists are defined in my XML. So I have, I have this, usually what I end up doing if I can't use link is I get a constants class where I have a variable which is the title field name equals and then the constant, right? It's, it's kind of ridiculous code that you have to write. Link gives us the ability to have a strongly typed, and in general what I'm doing, gonna do is generate a .NET class to represent the table. And each column of the table or each column of the list is represented by a property on the object. So I want to do things in Tele since I get that. Has anyone here done Link before? Not using either with or without SharePoint? Some of us have. Uh, a lot of people, right? Today it's called Entity Framework. But when SharePoint 2010 was shipped, the Entity Framework was still beta. It was part of .NET 4, so it wasn't available. So we have this. So Link to SharePoint. The SharePoint product shipped it was spmetal.exe, right? So it's a SharePoint meta, metadata, so spmetal.exe. I can give it a parameter file and tell it, hey, go look at a SharePoint site and generate my classes for me. Right? It does not include all the built-in columns. And I point that out because if you remember my KB article in my content type, I was using uh, the created date and the author. You know, the out of the box comms, those don't automatically get included. So the, whoever wrote SP Metal, the guy at Redmond who did that, decided what fields would people would typically access programmatically, and those get included. And anything that's not typical does not get included. You typically don't write code that create the author. You let the system happen it automatically. So I have a parameter file to override that. As you'll see, choice columns and metadata columns aren't handled very well. In fact, a choice column comes across as a string. And if I have 
I'm sorry, lookups especially. Lookups are not, I didn't put that in there as well, right? The lookup columns, remember they have an ID, then a separator, then a value, so that it can show the things easy enough. But you need to parse that as an SP lookup value. Same with taxonomy, they don't handle very well in link. So while you get the value, you get the string representation of that column, you have to do further processing with that. And you'll see some of that in here. There is a property of the data context that's generated called log, which accepts a string writer. And what will end up happening is, as you at runtime, the SP, I'm sorry, the link to SharePoint provider will dump out the camel that it generates behind the scenes to run the query. So I use link to SharePoint. I write a T SQL like expression inside my code, and it's compiled. And at runtime, it generates the camel query, and uses the SP query object to query it for me. So all I'm really getting here is a, producti a programmer productivity aid. There's no guarantee that this is better all the way around. You can't say camel's better or worse than link, because under the covers, it's the exact same thing. But one thing to look at, there, there are cases in which the generated camel that they've done may not be the most efficient. Maybe. Um, Maybe you've created an index on a column after this class was generated. So if, you know, remember, in, in, if I do a uh, SQL Server query, at query time, the, the, the parser goes through and figures out the best execution path. Right? SQL Server is designed to do that kind of thing. Link for SharePoint is not designed to do that automatic tuning. It has a camel implementation. It does what it thinks it should do, and off it goes. So your environment may be different. Maybe you should look at that query and make sure it's working. Look at your performance logs and so on. So just to, I'll show this to you on the slide deck, and we'll see it in the code as well. Here is a, an example of a language-integrated query. So this is a C-sharp version in which I'm just using what looks like T-SQL to choose all the columns of the article list, where it's approved, and where the keyword contains the string libraries. And at runtime, that gets generated into this. Right? So you can write that, or you can write that, your choice. What's that? Waldeck writes the camel. Yeah, we, we know. Yeah. Guys who extend Visual Studio tend not to take shortcuts. I've learned that in my history, right? <laughs> All right, let's switch back to the code here, and we'll go through that. So in my Visual Studio project, I have a folder here called code, because I had a bunch of stuff that doesn't fit into Richter's plan of stuff, right? So I just created a code, a code folder. And inside my code folder, the first thing I have is my spmetalparams.xml file. And this is the parameter file that I use for the spmetal command. Notice that it's a, line two is a comment that I put in there because I would copy and paste it into um, the, the command line to run it. And so I'm passing in a, a parameter of a website, spweb. And then I can tell this, the file that I want to generate is the code. And then I can specify a namespace to use for my class. Remember I said the spmetal will generate .NET classes for me. By default, they have no namespace. So I can put them where I want them. And in the command line, I say I want to use a parameter file. And what you're looking at right now is that parameter file. This is documented in the SDK. One thing I want to point out, again in line two, you'll see where the slash web is sp1 slash site slash isc. And I'm sure you all remember the diagram that, that Miriam put up. It says our site is called intranet.iscLondon.local. There is no requirement that you run spmetal against the same site at generation time as you run at production time, which is a good thing. Excuse me, Mr. IT Pro, can I log on as administrator onto your, physically log on to the box to run some utility? Yeah, that's not going to happen, right? However, you can point SPMetal at a remote site. In my, what I did, I, I was developing, right, not on the conference servers because I'm a fourth of the world away, so I'm developing on my local machine. I could specify, if it determined, there's a uh, parameter that says slash remote, and then I can specify user ID and password, and the SPMetal command will use the built-in SharePoint web services to get the lists and the schema of those lists and generate the classes for me. So you don't have to run this on the same machine. You can run it on anything that has a similar schema. Identical schema, I should say, identical schema. So line five, I'm going through it here, and notice I'm, re I'm creating a type called articles, despite what the list name is. Right? 
And then you can see here I'm specifying that article, which I showed you it has two content types. I really only want one of them. I'm still going to see the item content type, because remember my content type inherited from item. In the .NET class, I'm going to inherit from a class called item. But my data context, which is the whole wrapper object, is, it's not going to have a property for item. It's going to have a property for articles, because that's the only one I want in this instance. Line 7 says, in addition, include the moderation status column. Remember, not all out-of-the-box columns are included by default. And our requirement is we want to be able to say we only want things that have been approved. So if I want that approved column or that moderation status in my .NET class, I need to tell it. And so that's what I've done there. And then in addition, I said include the log list. If you were to run STMetal with no, uh, no um, parameter file, it looks for every list in the site. So it's possible if you're running this remotely against a QA server or production server, whatever you're allowed to do, there may be lists in that site that don't apply to your application. And in fact, my application here is kind of designed to coexist anywhere. You can set, you know, activate the features and you get the things. So there could be a document library in that site. I don't want that document, I don't want that document library in my .NET class. So that's why I only specified these two things. And I have the exclude other lists as line 13. Are we good on the parameter file? Yes, yeah, see the guy in front says yes. Awesome. When that runs, you notice I get this kbase data context.cs. This is my generated class. Notice at the top I have this mumbo jumbo. And this looks familiar to me because I was around when the data set generator came out with ASP.NET 2.0. It's the exact same comments. Basically, hands off. So I'm going to close this so I don't break anything. I need to go back and point out. Sorry, I wanted to point out one thing before I did that. Notice I have partial classes. So this is exactly how and any framework works today, I'm generating partial classes. If I want to extend this, I should create a new CS file and do a partial class myself and leave this part alone. Right? I didn't extend it at all, but the ability is there. I'm going to open up the class viewer, which I know is hard to see in the back, and I'll zoom in in a minute. But here is my data context. And you can see down here at the bottom, I have a data context object, and it has two properties. One called articles, one called program log. So I need to create a new instance of that data context. And once I have that, I can access these two lists programmatically. And just to round trip this, if I choose the KBase article class, you can see down here it has all the properties of the things that are here and so on and so forth. So um, this is my category, the drop down that I have, and so on. So there's all the classes there. I can do things in C sharp. Does that make sense? So that was a long discussion for me to say, I had, now I have a class, I need to get data. I want to put some data in my list so that when I do a grid, I can see how it works. I make sure that I specified stuff correctly. Right? I said, I'm expecting one column to be plain text, one column to be HTML. Does it work? So I want to be able to do something like that. What I did is create a different Visual Studio solution, um, creatively named Load Sample Data. And in load sample data, if I open up the solution explorer, you see here, I have the same KB data context. I just took that CS file and copy pasted it into a new project. You could have a common data library, right? It's kind of hard for me to have a common data library with people across all over the world, but if you could do that. This is a throwaway program that I was ready to throw away until we we're on a call and someone said, I need to get sample data. I was like, well, hey, I did that before. And so you, Walt, uh, Victor has a similar version of this that does a lot of stuff that he needs. So real quick, what this is doing is just reading a data file of XML. I don't need to go through the whole layout of that. But in a general, I'm going to then create my data context. And this line here, line 44, is the important bit. When I create this data context, I pass in a URL. This is the runtime URL that I want to access. Does not have to be the same as what I did on the generation. However. The site at that URL, the SP web, must have a list called articles that has the columns that I defined. It can have extra columns, and you could probably get away with deleting a column that's not referenced by your code. Not that I'd want to take that chance. So SP link, or link to SharePoint, does not solve the, oh, end users who know better can go and change the schema on me. You still might need to write your field changing event receivers to abort the list. And I don't, why I didn't write that, I don't know. I just thought of it today. So that issue is still there. So when I create my data context, 
And then further down, if I go down here, um, once I had the data context, or in addition to the data context, I get my classes. So the article is the class generated to represent my article list. I create a new one, I set the properties, and then I can say, hey, data context, I want you to, in when I call submit, I want you to insert this class into the collection. And then when I'm done, I say submit changes and it does the inserts for me. Would you rather do this or all that other server object mile code, right? So this is really just a programmer productivity aid. So I'm going to run this again. I did it once before, I'm gonna run it again. So I'm just gonna throw some data in my list to make sure my scheme is correct. Any question on link while we're here? We'll do more, yeah. So the question is, if you're going to do remote and SP metal, remote and specify username and password, what permissions do I need to have on that remote site? You need to be able to see the schema of the list. So you need to have at least read access to the lists that you're trying to get to. At runtime, you'll obviously need appropriate permissions. Yes, but to read it again, and both SP metal, either remote or on the same box, will honor all permissions that are in place with SharePoint. Great question, thank you. I'm gonna click on view all site content and I now see that my article list has 178 items. Rock on, all right. So one other thing I wanna point out in this code that I wrote, when I first did it, I wasn't thinking ahead. Uh, I, we have approval. So I generated 100 items and none of them were approved. So it, this the example, again, this load sample is, will be up on the CodeBlex site when I'm done. All I'm doing, I'm cheating at the top here and I'm saying, hey, turn off the moderation, then load all my items and down at the end, I'm turning off the moderation. I'm sorry, I turn it off at the beginning, I turn it on at the end. And I got yelled at for not using the using statement, but I do dispose my objects at the very end. Who yelled at you? Eric yelled at me. But it's okay to do it my way. You wanna know why? Because my data context does all kinds of wacky stuff with the web object, and I've had problems before where it actually the, the, it blows up. And rather than figure out how to make it blow up, I just kept it open and let the data context reuse my stuff when it's done. End of the day, I dispose it when it's done. This is a development tool. Load sample data doesn't run on production. Best way I know in the world to clean up context is to cancel the process. I have no more memory loss. Are you happy now? He's not gonna be happy, but that's okay. All right. Okay, I'm done with data for now. Any question on my data? I have no idea how I'm doing for time. 1527, so I'm halfway done or I'm over? 15 minutes. 1-5? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we're gonna kick into turbo. Or he says go over. All right. But we, we break it at the 45 minutes. Okay. Um, all right, I'll cover a couple more things and we'll take a break. So next is web parts. Why are we using web parts? As we talked about before, we could do a publishing page. We didn't want to use publishing page, we talked about that. So I, and I, we have our built-in list form. Well, the built-in display item list form isn't really what we want for our knowledge base articles. So we want to use some custom display rendering. What are my choices for doing that? I'm not doing a publishing page. So I could write a plain uh, ASP.NET page and throw it in underscore layouts. By the way, that's called an application page and it's meant to be an administrative page for the SharePoint application, so keep your mitts out of there. Plus, you can't do that in the sandbox. So that's a non-starter, so what am I gonna do? Web part is perfectly designed for this. The idea around the web parts is that I have a window into some application or I have a piece of functionality that I want to be portable and put anywhere I want. That's exactly what I want. I wanna be able to display one list item out of a list onto a page and make it look pretty. That's what a web part's for. I wanna be able to do a, specify a, a simple query parameter and get a subset of the list items and show that in a grid. That's a perfect web part approach. So I'm gonna do a web part. I have two choices, visual web part or the, old, the original old school server controlled web part, right? This is again, we're, web parts build on ASP.NET web parts, not the old SharePoint things. So what's wrong, visual web part means I can type in XML and just put in some eval codes and a little bit of code behind. Server controlled web part means I need to override the create controls method and build up the control hierarchy by myself in code, which is a lot of work. So I typically avoid the server control web parts unless I really, really need it. When SharePoint 2010 first came out, visual web parts didn't work in the sandbox. 
And some of the guys on CKS Dev, and I don't know if it was these guys or some of their cohorts, figured out a way to say, well, I can make that, eight, that HTML that you type in, pre-compile that, package it into the assembly, and deploy that to the sandbox, and that works just fine. And the CKS Dev had a visual web part, right? In addition, the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft developed a Visual Studio extension in their power tool set that does a Visual Studio web box as well. So um, I typically use the one from Microsoft because when I go into clients, I can say, well, I've got some code written by some friends of mine, or I've got some code written by Microsoft. Which one can I run? And you can imagine the answer. Well, I don't tell them what I actually run. <laughs> so you can do a visual web part in the sandbox if you choose the right spy, and I'll show you that. I have a screenshot. So again, my sandbox, if I'm writing a web controller, I need to understand, am I running in the sandbox or running full trust? When you, I didn't show this to you. I'm going to switch over real quick. I don't know why I missed this. When you create a project, oh, wrong one. I'm going to close this. When you create a project, you choose whether to use um, a sandbox or not. Let me open the, I'm opening the properties window. So if I, ch oh, that's really big. And what I'm showing you here is the properties of the SharePoint, I'm sorry, the properties of the Visual Studio project. And I have a sandbox solution, true or false. The reason for this, when I set it to true, under the covers, Visual Studio uses a different DLL to provide IntelliSense. Is a convenience to you about what may or may not run in the sandbox. Things that are definitely not available in the sandbox don't show up in IntelliSense. This is not the same as the validators that Eric and AC were talking about before. That's in addition to this. This is just, again, a programmer tip to say, I'm going to reduce the intelligence for you. Right? So that's, you need to be aware of that. And when you're doing that, the, the web part um, API then changes for you. So you need to be aware of what you're doing there. Another thing that was not on Eric's slide about the sandbox, which is the big gotcha for developers, is this whole client script manager. Basically, if you're writing code, in uh, ASP.NET and you want to put something out on a, a script out on the page, let's say you have the web part gets installed twice, because the users never do, do that twice, right? You don't want the same JavaScript file loaded twice on your page, and you would normally tell the ASP.NET Ajax, hey, client script manager, if it doesn't exist, then you add it. If it's already there, then only add it once for me, right? That client script manager is not available in the sandbox. That's one of the things that it works just fine. It looks fine in Visual Studio. It compiles just fine. But on Eric's chart where it had the, the IIS process and it gets passed over to the SPUC process, that SPUC process creates a fake page object. And the page has client script manager. But at the very end of that user control process, when it takes the editor HTML that's been generated and it passes it back to IIS, it only passes the body tag, if you will. I'm sure that's not the technical reason, but that's how Paul thinks of it. So anything that script that you would put in the head doesn't come back over. So any script that you need to load, you need to figure out a way to get it on your page without using Client Script Manager if you're in the sandbox. Same thing with CSS. So that wonderful CSS registration tag that's available in SharePoint doesn't work in the sandbox either. So that's what those two things are there. That makes sense? This is important to me. Our solution doesn't have any client-side script, but I do have CSS. So I need to find a way to get the CSS out there, and I'll show you that. So I put in here a screenshot. This, at the very across the top, is the Microsoft provided spy. It says Visual Web Part parentheses sandboxed. What it does under the covers, I mean, this may be hard to read. It generates the ASCX file, as you'd expect. It generates the code behind, and you can't see this, but it's got the ASCX.g lowercase g.cs. What ends up happening is. This property, this is the property view. I clicked on this spy, the ASCX file, and in the properties pane, it shows a custom tool. And this is SharePoint Web Part Generator. And what happens, every time I press, I, I change that ASCX and I save it, Visual Studio invokes the same process that ASP.NET uses to just-in-time compile the markup, and it grabs the output of that compile, and it sticks it into this file for me, which is then compiled into my assembly and deployed all at once. In addition, um, you can't receive it because of the red line. The properties of this ASCX file is do not deploy. The ASCX file that you code is not sent into the WSP package or put onto SharePoint. Because at runtime, that is all those, those controls, the 
uh, ASP.NET controls or HTML controls that you specified are all generated at runtime in code. So it works great. Until you have some type of typo in your markup. So if you have malformed markup and you press save and it regenerates that .g file, if you have malformed the uh, XML or HTML, it can't generate it, so you get an empty file. And so you'll notice that if I want to refer to an ASP.NET control in my code, for example, my grid control, next thing I know, it says the grid control doesn't exist. You have to declare it. And you're thinking, wait a minute, it's in the HTML. So that's a little tip. If you, if you think you have a control ID and you don't see it in your, in your code behind, then you have a, some type of typo in your ASCX. That was a big gotcha that always got me. All right, so this is a great point for me to stop. Are we close at all to the regular break time? Oh, 10 minutes, I got 10. So let me go back and show you my um, web parts. We have two of them. I'm gonna close my property. Oh, let, you, uh, let me, if I go into my Explorer and I'm gonna open my SP and let's close a couple of these. Go to KB article details, um, uh, summary's open. I'm gonna zoom in on the same thing that was on the slide. So I've chosen the ASCX file, and you can see here it's running this custom generator, and it's set to do not, I'm sorry, no deployment. So it's not deployed for me. So now let's get back to our scenario. I have 178 items in my list, right? And I want to present a summary of them in a web part, in a grid. The SP grid view is a beautiful control. It does all the CSS class names from Microsoft, the SharePoint. And I, yet again, SP grid view is not allowed in the sandbox. I don't know why. So in our example, well, let me close these down. Oh, should I talk about features? I should talk about features. I have a separate feature for list instances. Sorry, I missed this before. Remember I said I had one site columns and content types? I have a second one for list instances. In this example, they're both visible. Typically, I would hide the two of them and package, create one that's visible to, to you know, create the lists. Or just hide the, hide the site columns one and, and set up the relationship, if I will, a dependency, so that you activate one, you get everything you need. That's, uh, I just want to close the loop on that. All right, in my uh, Solution Explorer, if I go back to my Article summary. So here's my markup on this. I can click in design view, but there's not a lot to see here. You can see I have just a div at the top. And then I have my category. Remember I said my category is a drop down, or a choice column. So because I'm not using the out of the box SharePoint controls to render this item, I, I don't get the built in automatic drop down list that comes with. So I had to recode this. I could, if I wanted to, inspect the list properties and get the choice values, and I was gonna do that, just ran out of time. So I had to copy, paste, and put these in here. Notice the values, though. Those values look a little wacky, right? Uh, this is because link. Remember I said how link doesn't handle things very well out of the box? So let's go back and look at the data context. And I'm going to choose the article class, I'm sorry, the KB article class and I look at my category keyword, and you can see here, this is the property of that object. Nothing too interesting, but it's system nullable of this KB category, so let's click on that. And you can see here, this is an enumerator, and there's my choices. None, which is zero, invalid, which is one, and then you can see in the property attributes, square bracket, core functions is equal to number two, and list is equal to four. That's a bit ugly. That's the price of doing business with Link. Right. Now, I can, I could change this instead of it being this enumerator, I could just return it as a string and parse the string myself. Right? Your choice, whatever you wish to do. This is, I just want to show you this, how Link handles these non-text, non-integer columns. It's always a bit wacky, so you need to look at it when you're done. So there's my drop down. My, the UI for this, I, didn't, I should show you, this may or may not work, I can't remember if it works. Basically, okay, yeah, great. So we have a grid of our, our articles, and at the top I'm gonna let you filter by category and or filter by keyword with a button. And the filter command it does as you'd expect, let me double click on that, and here's my code behind on that. 
Why the tab size is 18,000 columns, I don't know. But this is typical .NET code, right? If the page is valid, I need to do something. So all I'm doing here is I'm setting a, in the, in the event handler, I'm setting a page scoped variable for what they chose in the category and what they typed into the keyword. And then at on pre-render is where I'm doing my querying, right? I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm not updating a form and clicking enter, so I'd have to worry about loading previous state and so on. This is a pretty simple web part. So at on pre-render, I'm going to write my query. And so here at line 47, you can see is, um, let's see if I can collapse that a little bit. Starting at line 47 is that same query I showed you in the slide deck where I'm choosing that. I'm defining a variable called QRY, which is of type iQueryable. That's the built-in link stuff that comes with your .NET framework. If they've chose a category, I'm going to append this where clause to my thing using a Lambda expression. We all love Lambda expressions, right? Yes. Same thing on the keyword. So what I'm doing here is I'm building up a query dynamically at runtime. If I was to do this in Camel, I have a where clause, and if you remember back at the slide deck, I can do an equal element to say equal you know, the keyword and whatever the value is. If I have two, if I have both category and keyword, I need to have two equal elements wrapped in an and element. So now I'm doing a lot of XML manipulation or string manipulation. Again, you can do this or you can do that, your choice. At the end of the day, I end up with this QRY object, and then further down you'll see I am just doing a simple, um, generating a, a generic list based on that query at line 63, and then I end up binding that at line 71, you see I bind that. Now, in addition, there's a couple extra requirements around my scenario here. I want our article page to look similar to our, you know, our, our the reason we're having a custom display is because we want some custom formatting. So how do I do that? I want to do that in CSS, typically. And if I go back to the markup, you'll see that I, we've specified a lot of classes. So you can see here I have the uh, CSS class name for the header and the so on. So I have all that. And at the very top, you'll see I have uh, CSS. Right? And in my project, I specify in the modules uh, assets. Here's our style sheet. So this is just a typical, oops, wrong thing. We'll talk about modules in a minute, but I have just a CSS page to find typical stuff. So now remember before at the beginning I said you don't have the CSS registration or the script link? Let's think about this. Web part needs to have a CSS file. How do I get CSS on my page? I can put it in the master page so that it's rendered, and it's, you know, rendered every time, a little bit of waste of resources. I only have 13 lines, probably not a big deal, but what if it was massive? Do I want to output this CSS on every page of the site? I typically do not. So let's think back to our plain old ASP.NET days. If I go back to this tag, all I've done here is I've simply said run at equal server, and I gave it an ID. It is now a server control. And in my code, I can then, at the very top, I skipped over this. I'm basically saying, give me the spcontext.current.site.url. So that's the URL to my root collection. And then I'm, I know that it's in the site assets library. And so I can build that dynamically. So now this CSS, as long as the web part is put on a page where that, the same feature where the CSS is deployed, it'll just work. Life is good. And then the last thing I'm doing down here is a similar concept is when you have a grid, the idea would be to click on one of the items in the grid and get a detailed view. So in my grid, I need to provide a URL. I don't want to use the out of the box URL. I want to use my custom one. And so you can see here what I'm doing is I have a, this article page name in a constants file, which basically is telling me it's this at pages. We'll talk about pages in a little bit. But I'm basically saying here I'm going to render the URL for in the, col the first column of the grid is my URL column. I'm going to specify what that URL is. Let me show you that real quick. And that is right here, this hyperlink field is part of the grid. So you can see it has a name. It's getting the ID field. It's using this article details and so on. Article details, notice I specified a relative link there because I wanted to put something in there, but in the end I needed to make sure it worked. So I'm overriding that URL encode. 
So let's run it and see what happens, right? Great way to start a break. Because when you press F5, nothing ever goes wrong, right? So I press F5, and it's going to deploy my solution. It's in the sandbox. It's going to redo everything. Do you want to attach to the process? Sure, because I was told earlier I don't have to read that. I can just say attach. And I see, there's my grid. So how do, why do I see this? Because I, before you got here, I went into the home page and I added this web part. And you can see I have nothing. Well, I need to choose one, right? If we look at the code, I choose list and I choose filter. I still see nothing. Who knows why I see nothing? Because Visual Studio deleted my list. Now you know I wrote an application to generate list items for me. <laughs> Am I 10 minutes up? All right. So this is, we've got more to go through. We'll do that. We'll take it was a 15-minute break, I believe, right? So top of the hour, we'll start again. We'll go into more detail on the other web parts. And then any questions you have and move on.